we're going into a brand new series called Gratitude. Somebody say gratitude. gratitude. We're going into a brand new series, and I'm excited because this is the month where we should be most thankful. This is the month where we celebrate how grateful we are for everything that we have and everyone that we have. And so I thought it would be so fitting. I felt the Holy Spirit nudging me to say, let's take our church through a series on gratitude. And so if you're ready, we're gonna get right into it today. And uh, I'm excited because I just feel like I have some good things to share with you guys about what God wants to do at Courageous Church through this series. It's gonna be really, really good. And I'm just, I'm just, I'm just really, really excited. All right, all right, open your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter number nine. 2 Samuel chapter number nine. That's in the Old Testament. 2 Samuel chapter number nine. If you're watching online and you're ready for the word, give me a thumbs up in the chat. If you're watching online and you're ready for the word, give me a thumbs up on the chat. If you're listening to us on the podcast, God bless you. Welcome to Courageous Church. You got to come physically and check us out. And if you are a part of the thousands of people who watch us on YouTube, God bless you guys. We're so excited that you get to be our church without borders. And uh, we know that God is speaking to you right from where you are as you watch online as well. That is 2 Samuel chapter number 9. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, and it says this. It says, Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? That's good all by itself. I can stop right there if I'm preaching on gratitude. But I'm going to give you a little bit more context before I go into this message. Let's jump down. Let's jump down to the ninth verse, and we'll read a couple more verses because David does something for uh, the grandson of Jonathan called uh, Mephibosheth. And I'm sorry, the son of Jonathan called Mephibosheth, grandson of Saul, King Saul. Mephibosheth, and so he's bringing him before him. He's about to show kindness to him, and this is what he decides to do for the uh, descendant of the house of Saul, son of Jonathan. He says, And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belongs to Saul and to all his house. You, therefore, and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him. And you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king has commanded his servants, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Wow. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem for uh, has Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem for he ate continually at the king's table and he was still lame in both of his feet. I want to talk to you from from the subject if I can today as we get into this first part on gratitude. I want to talk to you from the subject matter attitude of gratitude. There is an attitude that goes with gratitude. Let us pray. Awesome God, have your way. Continue to speak and move like you already have done through this worship and this amazing, incredible fellowship that I feel in this room. There is there are some hungry people here who came to hear from you. Can you get me out of the way? Move me aside and just make sure that people hear from you today. God, I decrease that you might increase in me, Holy Spirit, that people might receive a word from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Worship team did an awesome job today, did they not? Hey, listen. If you have any worship in you, if, you, if you're called to worship in any kind of way, I want to challenge you to try out for our worship team. See Michael Pillay. Michael Pillay, throw a hand in the air. They didn't see you on stage today. Michael Pillay. See Michael Pillay at the end of the day, and uh, he'll show you the way. Amen. Bars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm feeling preachy rappy today in Jesus' name. That's the kind of pastor we have it here. We wear J's and we quote bars in the, in the, in, in the pulpit, uh, but we do stay close to the word. Amen. 
Yeah, so, so this is great. I'm excited to start this series on gratitude because I, I, I just believe that we should be more grateful. Can I just say that? Just across the board. I think that as Americans, we have the opportunity to, uh, to have so much more than so many others around the world. And we have access to so many things and we can do so much and we can go so, so, so far and we can do things so quickly that oftentimes I think that we can lose our sense of gra uh, uh, gratitude and gratefulness. I think that it's really easy to just focus on things that we don't like and things that we don't uh, 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 want and things that we're upset about or things that irritate us that we forget to say thank you and tell God how thankful we are for having the good things that we have in our lives. Somebody say amen right there. Amen. I've always been a very grateful person. I've always been a very thankful person. Uh, this reminds me when I was a teenager, for those of you guys who are here for the first time, my mother was a drug addict and a prostitute from the time I was born until I was about 12 years old. She went to prison and got saved, gave her life to Jesus behind bars, and she got out of prison. And when she got out of prison, she came and found me and drug me to church. She took me to church. I didn't want to go to church. I went to church, though. And then uh, as I was there for about six months, my life was transformed by going to church. And uh, in July of 1999, I gave my life to Jesus as a 15-year-old young man. That's why we take our children's ministry so seriously. That's why we have next gen and soon to be you'll hear visions about us launching our youth ministry because we know that life change happens in the lives of young people. And so my life was dramatically changed and my life was dramatically rearranged as I said yes to Jesus and as I came into relationship with him. And one of the things that I had to be honest about as I began to have relationship with Jesus was the fact that there were some things that I could not do that I was ashamed of. And one of those things was reading. So I did not know how to read on a comprehensible level as a ninth grader. Uh, I, I was reading on like a second grade level when I was tested after I got saved and gave my life to Jesus. The only way that I found that out is because I really wanted to learn how to read the Bible. I wanted to know this new nature that God had called me to walk in. I wanted to know this new man that he had called me to be. And so I got together with a teacher. Her name was Mrs. Fraley. She was my English one teacher and she was about to be my English one teacher again the next year because I had failed the ninth grade. And so therefore, when you flunk a class, you got to take it again. Somebody say amen. Yeah, and so I was about to have Miss Fraley for the second time, but this time things were different because I had this new mindset about myself. I had this new sense of gratitude about what the Lord had done in my life, and that gratitude produced a humility that opened me up to Mrs. Fraley to tell her the truth about where I really was. And so I told her, I said, I don't know how to read on a comprehensible level. So she took me and taught me hooked on phonics for a full grade semester, improved my reading fluency. Things began to improve in my life. My reading began to improve in my life. And I began to get caught up on my grades, summer school, after school, before school, whatever school it took to get caught up. I got caught up on the things that I was behind in. Now, I can give Miss Fraley a lot of credit here, but I believe the Lord had used Mrs. Fraley to teach me and to have patience with me and to make sure that they that she she poured into me in a way where I could learn how to read. And so because I have so many situations like that in my life, I am, I am overwhelmed with gratitude in my heart constantly about people who have poured into me. Now, Mrs. Fraley is retired today, and Mrs. Fraley taught English for a long time after I graduated, but I will tell you this, Mrs. Fraley never failed to hear from me on a regular basis because I wanted to look Mrs. Fraley in the face as much as possible anytime I was close to that school and let her know how much what she did meant to me and how much what she's doing to other young people matters. And if she just continues to speak into young people just like me, then just maybe somebody else may come along to say thank you for what you have done in their lives. Mrs. Fraley, I want to say thank you. I hope that find some way you find and see this video somehow. I want to say thank you for being so kind and so patient and being willing to teach and train and help this young boy that had been to 16 different elementary schools, six different middle schools, and three different high schools. And because of my inconsistent education, I could not read. I did not have the opportunity to learn like everybody else did, but you took time to make sure that I could do what I didn't think I could do. And because you sat there and you showed me how to do reading fluency and follow along with my finger, I now can read and understand the word of God. And who would have ever thought the investment that she made in me as a young man at 15 would be paying off today every week when I stand before you? That, my friends, is called gratitude. 
That, my friends, is called being grateful. And that is the attitude that God wants us to have. And so we find David in the same situation. Y'all know I was coming back to the text. We find David in the very same situation, and the very fact is, is that David has stepped into his kingship. He has no reason to be nice to anyone anymore. He doesn't have to. He's large and in charge. He is the king of all of Israel, but yet and still, he asked a question. No one provokes him. No one asked him. No one mentions Jonathan. No one says anything about them. David remembers because of the gratitude that is filled in his heart. He starts to ask the question, is there anyone? left of the house of Saul that I could be kind to because of Jonathan's sake? Is there anyone that I can express my gratitude and my kindness towards for what he has done for me? And this is the type of heart that God wants us all to have in the fact that it doesn't matter what you have, it doesn't matter how blessed you become, it doesn't matter if everything on your bucket list gets checked, you still have a heart of gratitude and you're always looking to say, thank Thank you for those who have invested in you. Oh, I need a good amen right there. All, all 16 of you, I'll take it. And until I get all of you to clap and, and be excited about that, I'm going to keep preaching to you today until we get there because we're going to leave this room grateful people. Amen. amen. And, and so you got to understand the history about David to understand how difficult it might have been for him to express this level of gratitude to Uh, Saul and his family. You see, David was anointed to be king as a young man, 14, 15 years old. The oil poured on him. He was he was anointed to be king. He was a shepherd boy keeping the sheep, someone forgotten and not even thought about. But yet God anointed him to be the next king at age 15. And then he comes into the kingship uh, uh, serving Saul as an armor bearer. And as he's serving Saul, Saul, the Bible says Saul loved him. He looked upon him and he loved him. And so Saul loved and embraced him. And then all of a sudden, when David slept, Goliath, he comes back and something starts to rise up in David because David had a dual nature. He was a worshiper, and that's why he was recruited initially by King Saul, but he was also a warrior. I love it. You see, I, I hate when people try and make Christian men out to be soft. Christian men are not soft. Christian men operate in meekness. That means that I can be strong, but I choose to be meek. I choose to temper myself. I choose to keep in control of my attitude. I choose to not allow my aggression to get the best of me or you because we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is the type of man that David was. David was a worshiping warrior. David was a bad mama jamma. He would write a song of worship and sit here on the keys and say, I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you that I love you more than anything. Then he'd pull a sword off and just cut your arm off. (laughs) David was a worshiping warrior. Every single lady in here, you want a worshiping warrior. You want a man that can fall to his knees and be soft before the Lord. Know how to treat you with kindness and Jesus' joy. But you want him to be able to get up off of his knees and stand up and fight for your family. Fight for your income. Fight to take care of you. Fight to protect you. Fight to keep you safe. This is the type of man David was. And so David was that type of man. And I love this about David because David was this dude. But, but before David became that man fully, David had some hard times with King Saul. The same Saul that loved him and embraced him. The same Saul that brought him close to teach him the kingship. The same Saul that would, that would be soothed from the, from the evil spirit when, Saul, when, when David would play the harp. That same Saul got jealous and upset with him one day when David came from the field slaying people and killing people. And, and all of a sudden someone says this thing that just triggers Saul, King Saul in a bad way. They said, they said Saul kills his thousands, but David... David kills his tens tens of thousands, and it messed King Saul up. 
He could no longer be peaceful, peace, peace, peaceable with David. He could no longer be kind to David. He could no longer be nice to David. As a matter of fact, his nice turned to nasty. They, the, the scriptures say that he threw a javelin at David one time to try and strike him with it. And it struck the wall next to him, but it didn't hit him. But it was close enough to. He meant to hit him, but he did not hit him. And so the Bible declares that over years, Saul, King Saul, chases David. David down trying to kill David because of his jealousy towards him and can you imagine how hard it must have been for David to then begin to think about being kind to this man named Saul or anyone from his house there's no reason to be nice there's no reason to be kind except King Saul had a son named Jonathan Jonathan was David's BFF. Jonathan became a covenant brother with David because he recognized the anointing and the power that was on David's life. And he partnered with David even outside of his father's, outside of his father's commands. He protected David from his father. He would send word to David and said, my father is coming. Be careful. Run. Get out of there. Leave. And David would get out of town and do what he needed to do because of Jonathan's kindness. And so I love this because there are two reasons here to either be nasty or nice this is good right here this is really good because life usually presents us with two opportunities to either be nasty or to be nice and David now has a life experience that has given him an opportunity to say I'm going to either be nasty to people for the rest of my life or be nice to people for the rest of my life and so David decides that even despite the way that he was treated by Saul the king he still decides to be kind to Mephibosheth Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan that was that was uh, that was uh, uh, that was paralyzed in both feet because he was dropped by his nurse as a child. And so he was lame in both of his feet. He could not use his feet. But yet David had had him brought before him and he started showing him kindness. And everybody focuses on Mephibosheth when they preach this story and how Mephibosheth was seated at the table. Come on now. They, they put the table on the, ta on, the, on the stage and they, you know, they put the skirt around the table. They, people say, you know, Mephibosheth was slid up to the table and he sat there with everybody else. And from the, from the waist up, Mephibosheth looked like everybody else. And he looked good just like everybody else. And all of his messed up stuff, all, everything that was messed up in his life was hidden under the table. Look at your neighbor and say, it's under the table. It's under the table. It's under the table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you messed up, but it's under the table. I know your life ain't right, but it's my studs under the table. I know you hadn't got to where you need to be, but just understand, it's under the table. That's the grace of God covering you under the table. Even despite how you are, God decides to bless you anyway because you're under the table. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm under the table. Could have preached that. But I want to focus on this other part. I want to focus on the attitude that David decided to have in this situation that I think is pretty awesome and I think it's pretty special and I think it's a gift that I flow in because I can be kind beyond the opportunity to be kind I, can, <laughs> I have a grace on my life to love to value and to say thank you to any and everybody who's ever done. And if you did anything for me, and I remember, I'm coming for you. I'm going to tell you thank you. And I'm going to make sure you get your flowers while you're alive. Come on, somebody. And so I think that there's an attitude that comes with that type of gratitude. And so I want to talk a little bit about that attitude and what David had. And so I want to define gratitude. Gratitude can be defined as the quality of being thankful or readiness to show appreciation for and to return kindness. This is good. And we see David acting this out in the scriptures here. And so let me give you a couple of points that I think you can take home that will help your attitude improve towards gratitude. And so here they are. So the question of the day is, how do we walk in the same attitude that David walked in? 
Because if we're studying the scriptures here and we're watching what he did, let's learn from his life and see how we might be able to leave with more gratitude in our hearts. Number one, this is the first thing that you got to do. And all these will start with the word remembering. So it'll make it really easy. I'm trying my best to make alliterations for you guys to take home and do some great stuff. Uh, Mrs. Uh, what's her name? Uh, Mrs. Fraley would just be really, really, really happy with me right now using the word alliteration. Hello, somebody. And so let's get into it. Let's do it. Number one is this. Remember how far God has brought you from. If you're going to have an attitude of gratitude, you got to first remember how far you've come, where you've come from. This is good because David, if you don't, if you don't just. I know when you think of David, you think of this worshiping warrior. They have statues and stuff. He's got the sword. Looks great. All that kind of stuff. Slinging a stone. Knocked out Goliath. Amen. But before all of that, David was a forgotten shepherd boy. David was a forgotten shepherd boy who missed out on the ceremony and everything else because his father didn't even think he was worthy to pull from the field into the house to be a part of this ceremony. David was a forgotten Warrior. He was, I'm sorry, he was a, he was a forgotten son uh, of his father, Jesse. And so we see that David did not forget where he came from. This is good. And so the attitude that he has towards Saul and everybody else is, I believe, a result of him remembering where he came from. He didn't forget by which he, where, how hard life used to be and how far God had brought him. Oh, this is good. And I think oftentimes we lose our gratitude because we, we, off, we often forget how far God has brought us from. Oh, this is good. It's testimony time in the house. Can we go testimony time? Old school church used to do testimony time. You take 30 seconds, take 30 seconds, tell your neighbor testimony. Tell them, tell them how good God's been to them. Tell them what he did for you. Tell them how he set you free. Tell them, tell them, tell them, tell them. And, 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 and we've lost that art in the church nowadays. We've lost that art to stop and think about how far far God has brought us from. Stephen and I were riding in the car just yesterday and Stephen came to tears. I was about to cough up tears too because we were talking about how far God had brought us from. And we were talking about the things that I have done and the stuff that I was exposed to and the 16 different elementary schools that I had to go to and all the stuff that I had to deal with in my life and all the things that my mother had to push through in her life to be who she was. And because I had to come through so much this is the reason why I have so much grace and so much kindness to people that are around me and even when you treat me mean and even when you're not kind to me and even when you don't give me what I think you should give me because God has brought me from so far away I begin to think about how good God is from bringing me from where I was and now it helps me to be kind today I need some grateful people in this place to remember where God brought you from. Don't you start acting all such and much. Don't you start getting all sedity and stuck up. Don't you start acting all high and mighty and forget where God brought you from. Don't you start looking down at other people who may not be as far along as you are and start talking about how they messed up and how they dosed up. You used to be messed up and doped up too. And it had not been for the grace of God, you'd still be messed up and doped up. Sheesh. I can always tell people who have forgotten how far they have come from because they lose their gratitude. They lose the ability to be grateful. They forget how good God has been to them. And so the attitude gets nasty. The talk gets nasty. The thoughts get nasty. And therefore, we forget where God has brought us from. And the solution is, is just to take a moment and think about the Lord, how he saved you, how he raised you, how he healed you, how he turned you around, how he placed your feet on solid ground. When you think about the Lord, it should make you want to shout hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. This is the attitude of gratitude. And this is why we sing songs like that in church, because we want you to think about how good God has been to you so you can not lose your gratitude. Number two, sheesh. 
remembering those who helped you along the way. Not only does he remember where he came from, but he also remembers those who picked him up when he was down. Can I just say this to someone in the room? I, I think you focus too much on the people who kicked you when you were down and not enough on the people who reached their hand down to help you up. It might have not just been one person in your life who believed in you, who thought you were special, who thought you were good, who thought you were well enough to speak kind to. You ought to remember that one person, and it ought to encourage you on the inside to know that someone in this world that God placed here was thinking about little old me. Somebody like a Miss Fraley was thinking enough about little bitty OG. Somebody was thinking, God bless, uh, uh, God bless Elder uh, Kenny Randall, uh, 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 a part of the men's ministry there at the Potter's house who took me under his wing and taught me man Hood, told me to pull my pants up, put a belt on, so, took me for my shopping for my prom suit when it was time for prom because I didn't know how to shop for a suit. And he took me, he made sure it fitted well, and I brought my little money with me while I was ready to spend a little money on my suit. He put my money to the side and paid for my suit, bought all the accessories, showed me how to put it together, gave me his Mercedes Benz to go to the prom in. And I don't know what he was thinking. I was young. I was, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't do that. Well, actually, I did that for my daughter. <laughs> I did do that for you. Look at that, see? Uh, Lord is good. You're a different child than I was. You're a different child. I'm just saying. I was still trying to find him. I was making a couple of trips a week to the altar. I was still being altered in Jesus' name. He showed a lot of faith in me. But I remember these wonderful people. Oh, Dr. Myron Ball. Have I told you about Dr. Ball? Dr. Ball was the podiatrist that actually spoke into me when I was a young man selling candy. I used to sell candy in this neighborhood and they nicknamed it Ontarioville when I left because I made so much money in this little neighborhood in Dallas. Bunch of rich people, bunch of business owners. I made friends with every business owner there and I'd take my candy. It was not even a sell anymore. It was just dropping off the product at that point. I just walked by Saturday, hey, here's your candy, here you go. Six bucks, thank you, see you next week, Bob. I mean, it was that kind of op. And, 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 and Dr. Myron Ball, uh, he, God bless his soul, he's, he's gone, he's with the Lord now. Dr. Myron Ball was an older gentleman, and, and he was a podiatrist. He had his own office there, and, and he would always ask me questions about my life. He, he didn't want just my candy. He wanted to know. He wanted to take some time. Hey, Ontario, how, how, how are you doing your grades? Your grades doing well? well? What college do you think about going to? You think about going to school? That's awesome. I think that's great. You should definitely be thinking, because you're a bright young man. You're awesome. You know that. You come in here. You just bring your joy in here. I, I just love when you come in here. You're awesome. You know, you're, and you know, I'm from the hood, so you know, people start being nice, she'd be like, mm, what you talking about, bro? What you talking about? Let me check you out, bro. His kindness was real, and it came from a real place. And his kindness went to a whole new level one day when he realized that we had a really dusty, horrible car situation. I mean, my mama had a car we used to call the Batmobile because it used to spit out fire every time we started. It was black. It was a Mercury Cougar. Mercury Cougar. It was a 1986 Mercury Cougar, and it was year 2000, maybe year 99. Yeah, year 99. So that thing was old. I mean, the steering wheel would, would let black stuff off your hands every time you touch it. The, 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 the starter was going out on, the, on, on it. And you know, this is old school. You got to get under the car, and you got to tap on the starter with a hammer. Oh, some of y'all ain't been there yet. That's all right. That's all right. I've been through some hard times. I can tell you how to fix some stuff real quick. I can tell you how to rig it up and get it down the street if we needed to. And so I'd get under there and tap that thing with a hammer, and it was a trip because it would start up. And then, you know, this was the car that we were embarrassed to take anywhere because anytime we took it somewhere, it would spill a quart of oil anytime we'd go. So we, had, we, we, we came up with a solution. We would carry around cardboard in the trunk, so we would pull the cardboard out of the trunk, put it underneath the spot, underneath <laughs> Oh, y'all know what I'm talking about. Hard times. And that thing died on us eventually, just gone. And we were going weeks without a car. My mama was calling everybody, come take us to church. 
Uh, my mama would leave the house two hours early to get to work because she got to catch four buses to get to work now. I, she put me on the bus route so I can get to school, make sure I got to school, make sure I knew how to get there, make sure I had the money and the, the coins to be able to get on the bus. And, and, and I was still selling candy at the time, so I came by Mr. Ball, and he was asking me about what was going on. And because he was nosy and because he was kind, he was like, you know what? Every two years, I get rid of my car, and instead of trading it in, I find people to give it away to. And I wonder, I just wonder, could you and your mom use a, a car? I was like, are you? Absolutely. <laughs> it took everything in me not to jump out of my skin that day that he offered that car. First of all, I didn't think he was telling the truth. Second of all, this is just way too good to be true. This man blessed us with a beautiful Cadillac that was just two years old. And I could not believe the, the pristine I mean, I'd never, I'd never been in a car this nice before. And listen, I came from hard times. This car was beautifully kept. It was wonderful. It was gorgeous on the inside. It had something in the glove compartment called a, a, a maintenance, uh, uh, what do you call it? A maintenance log. It showed every time it had an oil change. It showed every time something had happened. Uh, y'all, some of y'all laughing. They're like, that's normal. Yeah, that wasn't normal for us. That wasn't normal for us at all. We were the log. We were like, hey, uh, let's, so six months ago, it was leaking oil. It was shooting out on the left side. Now it's shooting out on the right side. I'm sure the gaskets are gone and the whole thing, the whole thing is just messed up. Okay, we were the log. This man had a log in the car. <laughs> and he gave it to us. No strings attached. God bless you. Enjoy it. And it produced such a gratefulness. I, I'll never forget the way my mama praised God that day at church, that Sunday. Driving down the street, she just crying because God had been faithful to us. Tithing when she, when she couldn't afford to, giving, serving, showing up, being faithful, showing me, being an example to me on how to serve God. Didn't have what she needed, but she was always doing what she needed to do. Asking everybody for a ride because she wasn't going to miss church. Church was too important. Her life was changing at church. Her boy's life had been changed at church. He'd gotten saved. We got to go to church. And thank you. And this is why we all have to have the heart of gratitude because we can't forget what God has done for us. And if you take a moment just to think to yourself about what God has done for you, I promise you it will produce a grateful spirit of gratitude in your heart too. Somebody say amen. amen. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Somebody in this room, you need to call somebody and say thank you. You need to send a text message and say thank you. You need to look somebody in the face, have lunch with them, treat them to lunch, and say thank you, and tell them why you thank them. I, I love this. Let's make this month just a thankful month. We're going to be grateful. We're going to produce gratitude in this church like never before. I'm so thankful, God, that you gave us this church. I'm so thankful for this location you blessed us with. I'm so thankful for this building that you just blessed. I'm thankful for these speakers that hang up in the sky that we were able to steward over for two years that we were able to use again in this building. Lord, I'm so thankful for these dream teamers you blessed us to serve in this church that just have a heart to serve Jesus. Lord, I'm so thankful for our child care CCK team and middle school team that's back there missing the message right now watching our children so that we can be in this room. Lord, I'm so thankful. You know, oftentimes we look at the glass half empty, but I think we need to become people who see the glass half full. Stop complaining about what you don't have. Start thanking him for what you do. What would happen in your prayer life if you started off just saying thank you before you asked for anything? What would happen if you just started thanking God for life in your blood and, and thanking God for waking you up this morning and thanking God for that you still have a job when other people in the economy are struggling? Thanking God that you still have a house when other people don't have a place to live? Thanking God that you have food on your table even though prices are going up on all of the food in the world? Thanking God that you got gas in your car when the prices are going Going up, thanking God that you were able to get a house even though the interest rates are going sky high. Thanking God for everything that you have. And if we start being grateful people, I believe God will bless you with more. The more you are thankful, the more God can say, I can trust that person with what I give him. God is looking for thankful people. He's looking 
for a heart that is grown. I'd be nothing. I would be nothing without the grace that God has blessed me with. Because of where I came from, I should have been a statistic. I should have been locked up. I should have gone to jail. I should have been in the streets. I should be a gang banger. I should be a drug dealer. I should be someone that I am not. But God in his grace and his infinite plan, he saw fit for me to be a husband and a father. He saw fit. He saw fit for me to raise sons. He saw fit for me to build a church. He trusted me enough to send me to a city called Tampa and build a church like this. He saw fit that despite who I was, despite where I came from, despite what I didn't have as a child, he saw fit to send people in my life who would speak into my destiny and speak into my purpose and help see me develop into who God called me to be. And for that, I am so grateful. For that, I am so thankful. For that, I am God. I am God's favorite because he loves me just that much. How grateful are you for what you have? The old folks used to say, when you're grateful for what you got, God will give you more. And I'm here to tell you, David could have been bitter and angry and resentful, but he chose to be grateful and show gratitude. That is the type of heart that God is looking for from his people. We need more grateful people and less people complaining about what they don't have. Number three, I'm almost done. The Holy Spirit is speaking all over this message right now. I just believe a grateful spirit is passing across this church and online in Jesus' name. Number three, remembering the good and not just the bad. Saul wasn't all bad. King Saul, who threw javelins at David, who chased him down to kill him, chased him into caves, was not all bad. At one point, Saul tried to equip David with armor to go out and fight Goliath. That was good. At one point, Saul referred to David as his armor bearer and loved him. That was good. But oftentimes, we only see the negative with the people in the circumstances we find ourselves in, and we focus on that, and we give our attention to that. I'm talking to people who have had bad situations like parentings and uh, parents and, and, and folks in your life, and, and, and sometimes all you think about is the negative that has happened in those situations. I want to challenge you to not just see the negative. I want you to find the positive in the situation. I want you to find the positive about that child. I want you to find the positive about that spouse that you feel like you can't stand anymore and you can't barely live with and talk to anymore. More. There was a reason you said I do. That's why you need to be at the marriage retreat. So make sure you sign up for it. Because there's a reason you got into this relationship. It's not all bad. You can't throw away the baby with the bathwater, as they say. Not everything is a wash, some of it is worth keeping. Some of it helped you to be who you are. Some of it helped to build you and not just break you. Some of it helped to design you and help you. If you can't say thank you for nothing else, you put me in the world. Thank you. Appreciate you being a conduit that the Lord decided to use to push me into the earth. Hallelujah. 
Thank you for giving birth to me. Thank you for making sure I was here on this earth. You got to find something to be thankful for because the more you look at it as a negative, you're going to become bitter and angry and you're going to rot from the inside out with hatred and you're going to reproduce that thing that you're upset with with them in the next generation when you get a chance to be it. You got to find the good even in the bad. And my last point, I'm closing. Somebody come to these keys because we got to get out of here. <laughs> we got a morning service now. I'm fired up. I'm going to get everybody out for brunch. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let's go. Fourth and final point. Remember, the bl remember to bless those who bless you. This is the Abrahamic covenant that sits on your life. God spoke to Abraham. He says, I will curse those who curse you. But he also said this, I will bless those who bless you. And I want you to think about someone this week that you can be thankful for. But not only just say thank you, I want you to show your thankfulness by being a blessing to someone who's been a blessing to you. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to hearing testimonies about, about uh, singing grams and stuff, you know, going to people's houses and, 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 and flowers that have been sent out to someone's house in another state. And I'm, I'm looking to hear about some Hallmark cards that you purchased with the words that you couldn't quite come up with with your own words and your own mouth to express how thankful you are to the people who are around you. Find a way to bless those who have been a blessing to you. I mean, David was a blessing because, because Mephibosheth should have been on the hit list because when you become a king, you usually kill out, you kill out everything that is left in the old lineage and he was supposed to be on the chopping block and that's why he was afraid when he came before David. But David showed kindness and not only was he kind with his words, he was kind with his actions. He was kind with his resources and he says, I'm going to bless you so much, I'm about to mess you up. Watch this, boy. Watch this. And Mephibosheth was so messed up, he could barely even accept it. He said, who am I but a dead dog that you would look upon to want to be kind to? Read the scripture. Go back and read the whole text there in 2 Samuel chapter number 9. But David, in his kindness and the gratitude that he had, he was so grateful for what his father had done for him. He says, boy, I'm about to bless your socks off. Let me show you what I'm about to do. I'm going to put you at my table, first of all, and you're going to eat the king's meat. You're going to eat from the best stuff. You're going to eat from the best bread. You're going to eat from the best of the best. The stuff I eat is the stuff you're going to eat every day for the rest of your life. Not just one meal. You're going to be here for the rest of of your life and I'm gonna pull you up to the table and I'm gonna hide your feet under the table and no one's gonna judge you for who you used to be because you're right here next to me now and everything I have will be yours and he says I'm gonna bless you with land everything that belonged to your father and your grandfather I'm giving you all of that land you can have it and I'm gonna even bless you with people I'm gonna send my servant over to make sure I'm gonna send your daddy's servant over that's still alive he's gonna maintain the land because your feet are messed up and you can't do much but don't worry I'm gonna bless you would help as well and they're going to take care of the land and they're going to till it they're going to make sure it's right they're going to take care of business did you see how David goes out of his way to bless Mephibosheth because of the gratefulness that was in his heart because of the gratitude that he walked in stand to your feet I'm not out of sermon but I am out of time <laughs> wow Here needs to leave with a different attitude towards gratitude. Amen. Amen. If you're watching online, put a hand up in the chat. I'm going to pray here in just a second. I'm going to pray for an attitude shift. You know, oftentimes when God is going to do something great in your life, he starts with your mind. That's why he says, let this mind be in me, which was also in Christ Jesus. Your mind is the place where gratitude starts and it manifests out of your hands in every other area of your life. And so I'm going to pray for you that the Lord would begin to shift your mind, that you would have an attitude of gratitude like David, that you wouldn't be bitter, that you wouldn't live a life of anger and resentment, that you wouldn't be upset and angry with, ever, with everybody who's ever done you wrong, 
but you forgive those who don't even ask for it, but you're kind to those who went out of their way. You, you find a way to find the good in situations instead of the negative. I, I want to pray for you today if you're in this room. Raise your hands right where you are. I just believe that there's an impartation that happens when you raise your hands. It says to God, I'm open. It says to the Holy Spirit, come on inside. I'm open. I'm, I'm not closed off. I'm open. Body language means something. It's 70% of communication. So you're communicating to God right now. I'm open. I'm open. I want you to feel me. I want you to do something on the inside. Right now, I'm going to pray for you. Father, I thank you right now for every person in this room. I thank you for every person that's watching online. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would cause the spirit of gratitude, that grateful spirit, that kind spirit, that, that desire to look and find people that I can be kind to, just like David did with Mephibosheth. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would heal broken hearts, God. I pray that you would heal people from unforgiveness and bitterness in the name of Jesus. Every parent situation that's gone astray where we can no longer remember the good, I pray that today you reminded us of the good. I pray every marriage situation that's on the rocks right now, Father, I pray that you would remind us of why we love them. Remind us of why they're special. Remind us of why we committed to them. Father, I pray for every wayward child right now that we've given up on. We've just thrown up our hands and said, we don't know what's going on. We, we, it's all bad. No, it's not all bad. We put something good in that child in the name of Jesus. And the Bible says when a child grows older, they will not depart. So I just thank you, Lord, that eventually that child's coming back to you in Jesus' name. I'm going to see the glass half full instead of it half empty in the name of Jesus. And God, I pray for a spirit of gratitude. Let us look up people. Remind us of folks. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you highlighted people in our lives that have been kind to us. Those who have spoken well to us. Those who spoke words that motivated us and pushed us into purpose. Those who said things to us that other people failed to say. Lord, I pray that we would leave this room ready to be grateful, ready to express gratitude. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Hey, right where you stand up, right before we leave this room, I'd be a bad pastor if I don't take this moment. Can you just bow your head with me? Close your eyes. I want to sweep this room and make sure that there's no one in this room that doesn't need a relationship with Jesus. You came to church today, showed up, wanted to check the building out. Amen. Looks great. Carpet's awesome. But I got a question for you. How's your soul? Do you understand that there was a gift that was given? The greatest gift that could ever be given to mankind was in the form of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He came to the earth and he lived a sinless life. And he went on a cross, shed his blood and died for every sin that mankind would commit. Now here's the special part. The only thing that you have to do to be grateful for that is accept his free gift. His free gift of eternal life. And that is through a prayer. That is through me praying a prayer with you, confessing him as Lord, allowing him to be the king of your heart, allowing him to lead and guide you for the rest of your life. If you're tired of running and, and you're, rear, you're weary and you're frustrated and you've been trying to do life by yourself, I want to challenge you today while you're here and while you're watching online. No one's moving around. Nobody's looking around. Takes all my time. I'm out all my business. This is personal. This is a moment right now. This is the moment for you if you need a relationship with Jesus. On the count of three, I want you to lift your hands if you're in this room. And you need to, you need to get right with the Lord. You need to give your heart to Jesus. You, you're ready to live for him. You're ready to make him your Lord. If you're here today and that's you, I want you to lift up your hand on the count of three. And I'm going to pray with you. We're all going to say a prayer together. And it's going to be the beginning of the rest of your life as you say yes to Jesus. One, this is your day. This is the moment. That spirit you feel right now in the room, that's called the Holy Spirit. He's telling at your heart. Two, this is your moment to say yes to Jesus. I promise you, this is going to be the best decision you ever made. I did it too at the age of 15. I'll never resent it. Three, hands up if you need Jesus right now. Right now, if you need Jesus, if you need Jesus, I see you in the back. I see you. Anybody else? I see you right in the middle. I see you on the side. Anybody else? You need Jesus. Anybody else? Hands up high. I want to see you. I want to see you. I see hands up. I see hands up. I see you. If you're watching online, throw your hand up in the chat right now. We've got time for this. This is the most important part. This is how you started. I see you over there. I see you in the front on the right. I see you. I see you. I see young people. I see old people. I see white people. I see black people. I see people raising their hands for Jesus in this room. Hands down. Wow. Now, can you guys all do me a favor? We're about to leave here, but I need to start this I do of your walk with God. You see, this prayer I'm about to pray is the I do of Christianity. It's like the marriage. I'm sorry, it's the wedding. 
But then when we leave this room, we're going to help you live the marriage out by walking with you on a regular basis. You showing up to this building every week to learn more about Jesus. But right now, this is about to be a marriage ceremony. And I want you to repeat after me because this is how we started. This is what the Bible tells us that we ought to do. So I want you to repeat after me. Everyone in this room, do this with me. So none of my brothers feel, none of my brothers and sisters feel alone. I just want you to repeat after me. Say, Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your kindness. And thank you for your forgiveness of my sins. Today, I make you my Lord. Today, I give you my life. Today, I give you permission to lead and guide me all the days of my life. Today, I confess that you are the Son of God, resurrected from the dead with all power in your hands over my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, come on now. The Bible says angels in heaven rejoice when one person repents. Jeez.